So something I did in January was take my notebook here and just write down everything I did in January in the month, whether it was a favorite thing or not. So something I've decided I'm going to do is from now on do still continue to do monthly favorites videos, but then also have a separate video that's more of a monthly wrap up. That way I can talk about things that I either had really negative thoughts on or just meh iffy feelings on, or if I haven't quite um, gathered all my thoughts or figured out the way I feel about something or think about something, then I can also mention it in that kind of video. I think there were points last year where I wanted to mention something because I liked it and because there wasn't like a separate video I was mentioning it in, I ended up putting it in my monthly favorites video. And I want my favorites videos to be more of a reflection of actual favorite things for me, whether it be new to me or just like an old favorite or something that I was familiar with and now has become a favorite. So this is going to be my January favorites and then probably right after this I'll just end up filming about what are the other things are from January that I experienced in some way. Uh, so first I'm going to start with something that doesn't really... It sort of has to do with film, it has to do with film, but it doesn't really fit into, like, the movie category. And that is the Criterion Channel Charter subscription service that is now available. So, if for some reason you don't know, uh, the Criterion Collection is going to have their own streaming service. It's going to be called the Criterion Channel, and it launches April 8th. What a day. Um, I'm pretty sure April 8th. I mean, that's a date that sticks out in my head anyway, because that's, like, the day that Twin Peaks aired, but then also it's the day that EXO debuted, so it's just, like, a great day overall. This year, a lot's happening for April 8th. So, until the day, that's the day that um, the Criterion Channel officially launches, so until that day, you can become a Charter subscriber, which involves other perks and uh, so far, they have um, a movie of the week. So it's now officially today, the second week has started. Um, so the first film that was like available was Mikey and Nikki from 1976, directed by Elaine May. And you were able to watch the film and also watch the supplements. Um, I'm pretty sure it was everything that's like available on the physical disc. Um, except for the audio commentary, unless for some reason I didn't see that option. Um, and obviously you don't get what's in the booklet. Now, the second, like, film of the week has gone up, and it's Chunking Express. I'm pretty sure that's what it's called, but for some reason that sounds off. Um, directed by Warcar... One Car Y? Something like that. Oh my god, I'm so sorry, I don't know. But it's a film that I've heard great things about, and I'm pretty sure it's out of print from Criterion, and now I can watch it, so that's really cool. I'm just, like, really excited to see what is going to happen with the Criterion uh, channel charter subscription, but then also when the channel officially launches, it'll just be really exciting. And it's it's pretty quick that they're able to get this, this just moving so quickly and almost at a time where... I mean, when did they officially, at like October maybe, they officially announced that Film Shrek wasn't going to be a thing anymore, and then there was like the rest of November to finish watching things if you had more things to watch, which everyone was really like trying to pile in as much as possible. I personally didn't have Film Shrek. I really wanted it. It just was, it's just something that I guess I had to like pull the trigger on, but um it's not a thing anymore, but now Criterion Channel's happening, and I I don't think I really had to get it, though, for reasons that I'm not going to get into, because it kind of doesn't have to do with me. That probably sounded confusing, but I probably am going to have it available to me anyway for certain reasons, um, but I don't even know if I've mentioned it before, so now I feel kind of weird if I have mentioned it before. And now I'm, like, tr being all secretive and weird about it. <laughs> okay. Okay, so I think that's all I have to say about the Criterion Channel subscription stuff. 
Uh, so next I have, I keep looking down at my notebook, by the way. Next I will talk about some movies that I've been watching. The first film that I watched in 2019 is Breathless from 1960, directed by Jean-Luc Godard. And this is just like a film I've seen so many times. I was, at the time, at the beginning of the new year, I was thinking about the French New Wave because my cousin is taking French this semester, or like this term, however her school does it, but um, I don't know if it's something that she's going to continue with after this semester or whatever, or if, or if it's just going to be like a one-time thing. I don't know. Anyway, my cousin is taking French, and she's been like really getting into French things, so um, I did two things for her for Christmas. Because I didn't give her anything like physically, I made her a playlist on Spotify. It's called A Playlist for Taylor. It's extremely long. Um, it's like 200 and something songs, like 250 maybe? I have no idea. Uh, I took so much time working on it, but I'm really proud of it. Even if it was like a playlist for myself, like I listen to it all the time and it's something that I made for my cousin. I mean, obviously it's a lot of my music taste, but I'm really proud of it. Like it transitions really well, like from song to song. That's what took me the longest time because it had to like the song had to sound good after the other song, and then the next song has to sound good after that. <laughs> uh, I put a lot of effort into it. Um, so, anyway, it's a mix of songs that are in English, songs that are in Korean, songs that are in French, songs that are instrumental or classical. Um, yeah, if you want to check it out, I'll leave it in the description. Uh, it's on Spotify. It's called The Playlist for Taylor. <laughs> um, so that was one thing that I like did for her for Christmas. And then I also shared a French film with her um, through like Google uh, Google Drive. And uh, I was looking at my films, my French films uh, that I had available on DVD. And uh, I ended up sharing with her Masculine Feminine because that's probably my favorite Godard film. Uh, but because I was like thinking about the French New Wave, um, this is one of the other, like, contenders that I was like, mm, maybe I should give her Breathless because it's, it's the, it's like the start of the French New Wave and it's such an iconic French film and so important for French cinema and just international cinema. So as long as everything, like, goes well with Masculine Feminine because I had, like, some issues with the subtitles, I just had to I have to get confirmation from her that it, like, all worked out okay. Um, so I'll probably continue to share some French films with her. And good, um, Breathless is probably going to be the next one. Yeah, this was the first film that I watched this year. If you don't know what it's about, it's uh, about this sort of, like, rebel guy. I'm really not even sure what his, like, title is. <laughs> um, he's a rebel. <laughs> uh, he doesn't adhere to the law, and he ends up killing a cop, and so uh, police officers are after him, and he is trying to get out of town, and he wants to take his sort of girlfriend. They're, like, kind of boyfriend and girlfriend. Um, we'll just call them boyfriend and girlfriend for the sake of me describing what happens or what the film is about, and um, she is struggling to, like, she doesn't know if she should go with him or she should just, like, stay in Paris or if she should, like, even turn him in or, like, you know, she doesn't know what to do with the situation. And, um, but it's, like, also Godard. So I feel, I say that this is his most, like, accessible film because there's actually, like, a plot line to it instead of just, like, interjected photos and random uh, voiceover narration talking about random things, <laughs> which I really like, but if it's someone's first Godard film, I don't know if that's necessarily, like, the best choice. The best choice. I was doing this, but it was out of frame. <laughs> okay. Um, I've also been continuing my rewatch with the Harry Potter movies. These never show up well, um, because it's, they're matte, except for, like, the one object on the cover. So here I have um, Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, which is the fourth film, and Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix, which is the fifth. And then this is, like, the part of the series where I start to get really frustrated because of things that they had to, like, leave out and just, like, small changes that they make that I'm like, no, this would have been better. And I just... it 
this is the part in the series, in the film series, where I have a hard time not just comparing it to what's in the books. Um, that's a personal thing. <laughs> um, there's just, like, so much more to the books that I, I just wish they were able to put in the films. I under I understand, though. Um, yeah, that's that would be a whole other video <laughs> or video series uh, talking about each one individually. Although I did watch these in, like, April of last year. So I do have, like, a Harry Potter movies kind of discussion uh, video that I'll link in the description. My thoughts are probably still still the same, if not more, like, enthusiastic. <laughs> and then I have a couple movies that I don't physically own. Uh, so Shirkers is one. This is a documentary from 2018. It's on Netflix. I actually saw Luke at Razor Wire Reviews. Um, I follow him on Instagram, and in his Instagram story, he started talking about it, and I was like, oh yeah, I remember seeing the trailer for that and being really intrigued by it. It's on Netflix. I'm gonna watch it, and so that's what happened. And this was really good. I, I, ah, uh, I have, I have a lot of thoughts on this. Um, so Shirker is, is about this girl, Sandy. Well, like now like she's a woman. Um, but when she was a teenager, a uh, young adult, like end of high school, beginning of college age, she made a film with a couple of her friends uh, who were also into film and filmmaking, uh, Jasmine and Sophie, Sophia, Sophia or Sophie, Sophie. Um, and more people, but they're the three, like, main people in, in the film, uh, in the documentary Shirkers, and then also there's George, I don't remember his last name, but George, he ended up working on the film with them and being an important figure and, uh, directing the, the Shirkers film, so, like, the documentary itself that I watched is called Shirkers, but the film that they were making is also called Shirkers, which is why I was having a difficult time, like, figuring out the wording there. So, what happened is that after they finished making this film, uh, George took all the footage, all the, all the stuff, all the important stuff, and Sandy, Sophie, and Jasmine just went back to college and continued doing their studies. Uh, and then they, like, basically never heard back from George, and he just took their film. Um, they, they um, filmed in Singapore. Um, yeah, that was, I don't know, that was just a random, uh, <laughs> that was just random information that I decided to tell you at this time. And, um, it's about Sandy now. She has been contacted by George's widow, who, um, like, contacted her and was like, uh, I have your film, do you want it? And so they went to, um, she went to go get it, and it's in, like, perfect condition. Like, like, he really took care of this film, but, like, didn't do anything with it and never contacted them again. So it just brings up a lot of questions. Um, every, everything's good with it except for the sound. There's no sound. Um, so that's the only thing. But I think that that really works for this documentary because the documentary has its own music and, and score and it like adds this creepy vibe that just like works so well because I find George to be so creepy. Like I don't understand how she was like, oh, I don't know, I just didn't trust it. Like whenever they showed a picture of him, I'm like, no, get out. Don't trust him. I don't like him. He just seems off and like cold to me. And they even described him in that way when they we're talking about what he was like, and I'm just like, isn't that, that doesn't, like, give you, like, a bad vibe? I just, I can't, but, like, the, the music worked really well <laughs> with, with that portrayal of George, which I kind of feel bad about because, like, he's dead, so, uh, you know, whatever comes out of this documentary about him, um, and that's the only information that we have about him. It's kind of just like, well, this is what your legacy is going to be like now. Uh, but they also talked to some other people who George was like involved in making, in helping them make their art. And he also like took from other people. And it's like he was like sabotaging and manipulating other people and like infiltrating their lives. And it was just like, why, I, I question, obviously, why he, like, took things and then didn't do anything with them. Um, like, 
I don't know. I, I guess he, obviously it would have been wrong. <laughs> um, not that stealing something isn't wrong, but he could have claimed them as like his own. Like he could have edited the film and like been like, yeah, this is my, <laughs> my film, uh, which he didn't do, which like I think makes his motive even more of a question to me. I want to know like what he, like what was his overall goal? Like what did he want in his life? Okay. Um, and then also, um, I'm trying to remember like what I wrote in my, um, Instagram description when I posted, um, about the film. I just, I really like the way the film that she made, like Sandy's film is so, it's so cool looking. And I just want to see like a compilation of all the footage that, that they have. I want to see the film just like without the sound. I guess if, if they have like all the film, if, if everything's fine, but they don't have sound, I still want to see it. I still want to see it because it, it seems quirky and like weird and kind of Lynchian in a way. Yeah. So sort of like Lynchian, but it's also like really bright colors. And I just, I don't know. I was really intrigued and I liked it. And, um, I mean, it, I didn't even see it in full context. It was just interspersed in these random times in the documentary. I have to move on to the next film though. Um, so, oh yes, Francis from 1982. I'm pretty sure this was a TV movie. Um, I don't know who the director is off the top of my head. Uh, but this is about Frances Farmer, and Jessica Lange plays Frances Farmer, who was a Hollywood actress, um, or at least she wanted to be an actress, but realized that Hollywood at the time, it wasn't really about acting, it was about making stars and um, the star system and sort of doing this, like, cookie-cutter, like, factory kind of production of, of filmmaking, not really being an art. And Frances really wanted to act. And so basically she acted out against Hollywood and figures in Hollywood. Uh, she didn't show up a lot. She ended up going into the theater for a while. And even though she had a contract, I think with Paramount, um, she just wouldn't, she didn't do anything um, after some time. She did have a few projects. I mean, if you look at her IMDb page, there's maybe like 10 things listed there. Um yeah, I don't know, 10, 15 or something like that. All pretty small things and like classic films that I haven't really heard of before, except for a few. Um, I would say she really only has like three big pictures and they're not even, they don't even like stand out amongst all the other classic film there is. But because she didn't give in to Hollywood, basically, uh, they made her out to look crazy, and um, I mean that in the real sense of the word. They uh, made her, I mean, yes, she was, uh, she drank, but they made her out to be, like, a true alcoholic, and, like, something was actually wrong with her brain, so she was sent multiple times to a mental institution, mental hospital. I'm really not sure what the exact wording should be here, because especially... I'm thinking about the images from the film, and it just gets progressively worse. Like, the first time she's she's there, she uh, is, like, in a room by herself. It's all very, like, white. There's a window, and they seem to be sort of taking care of her, or at least being aware of the fact that she's, like, a human being. And then the next time she's in a room, and they're just, like, disconnected to her, and then... I don't, it just, it, it gets worse and worse. The last time you see her in, in a mental institution, she's in this room that's crowded with all these beds and all these women. And they're like, they're like half naked, if not completely naked. And I'm just picturing like just hair and like feces and I just grossness. And she's like in a, one of the straight jackets and she's, uh, it's awful. And to know that it's all based on a true story. I'm pretty, I have read things about Frances Farmer before. And then this just sort of, film just sort of, um, helped me to remember those things that I had previously read. Um, like she was like raped because she was a movie star and she was like essentially chained. And so she couldn't like defend herself. 
Mm. I I mean I have so many problems with it, but also night like 1930s like if any uh I just I can't I have so many problems with it and so should everybody else but I just like am I can feel my uncomfortability and like frustration like build in my body right now I think the thing that I learned the most I'm again I'm like assuming that pretty much everything in this biopic is true um especially because Jessica Lang uh I watched the supplements on the disc and she was actually a really big fan of Frances Farmer and, like, really interested in her life right before she, um, got the call about this role. And so I'm, I just feel like Jessica Lange is the type of person to want to have it be as accurate as possible. And so she could also bring in that knowledge that she knows about Frances Farmer into the role, which I'm, she was great. And, um, yeah, just to make sure that, like, things are accurate. I mean, and also, again, I've read other things about Frances Farmer, and so the one thing that I didn't really know about her um, is more about her mom and her relationship with her mom, who I can't think of the actress who plays her, but she was really good, too, um, because she was really easy to despise. Um, at first, I was like, oh, okay, she, she's all right. No, wrong. I did not like her by even just, like, the middle of the film, because um, from the way, again, this is, like, from the perspective of the film, uh, this may be not as accurate information to Frances Farmer's life. Um, I'm saying, um, a lot is bothering me so much. Frances's mom, from what it seemed like, wanted to be an actress, or at least a star, and, and fame, and attention in that way, in the way that Francis doesn't want. And there's a scene where Francis comes back from asking her dad for advice and she comes back to her, her mom um, at home and is like, I've, I've decided I'm not going back to Hollywood. I don't want that. They mistreat me. And this is after she's already been in the mental institution at least once and her mom knows about her mistreatment there. Uh, and then her mom comes from down, um, comes from upstairs. And so there's this like power positioning happen happening. Um, her mom is like a few stairs higher than her. And then her mom gets really angry at her and is like, well, Francis, you must be crazy for not wanting that. Your agent just called and he's going to stop by tomorrow. And, and you are going to take some roles and you're going to be a huge Hollywood star and, and all of this. And she, and Francis is like, no, did you not just hear what I said? I don't, I don't want any of that. And then she gets, like, really angry at her. And again, she's like, my hands are, are people now. Um, she's, like, a few steps higher. And so it's just, it's that, like, power dynamic. And uh, gradually, Frances starts to, like, back up and realize that her mom would send her back to the mental, the mental institution because she doesn't understand, like, where Frances is coming from, apparently. I don't understand how she couldn't understand but, uh, yeah, that's something that, like, frustrated me a lot. But there, there's a line that Jessica Lang, as Francis, says, and that's, you really would send me back. And I just, uh, that's a, that's a good, memorable moment from the film. And I forgot what it's called, but I know that Francis Farmer wrote a memoir, um, or an autobiography at some point in her life. Um, yeah, I can't remember what it's called, but I've, I've constantly looked for it, and it's just, it's out of print, I'm pretty sure, so you'd have to find it used, and I haven't been able to find um, a good copy available um, that wasn't a ridiculous price. Um, so now that I'm thinking about it, I'm gonna, like, look for it again, or maybe if it's somehow, like, maybe has an aud audiobook, or I can find, like, a PDF file online or something like that. Um, yes. So I was going to say something else and then I forgot. Oh, I'm, I'm glad it seems like she was able to move on with her life from all the hardships and like terrible things that she went through, especially when she had such little control because she was no longer, she was she was, like, admitted as, as no longer, like, fit to think for herself anymore, so she was, like, under guardianship of her mom, even as an adult. Um, yeah, okay. I think that's it in terms of, like, films and stuff, and now I just have a bunch of music. 
Um, I don't have any books that are favorites, but I have been reading. And so I'm going to start with the non-K-pop things. Um, so that would be Bring Me the Horizon. They have a new album called Ammo. It's so good. I'm not sure what my favorite songs are. Maybe like heavy metal and one more that like for some... Oh, Medicine. That one's so good too. That was like a single they released beforehand, like almost right before the album dropped. Bring Me the Horizon. I love them. I've been listening to them since I was in like seventh or eighth grade. Like, and that's a long time. And I love, I love their sound change. Like I'm, I'm down with their progression and like them just doing the music that they want to do. Um, and then the main, uh, that's my favorite band actually. Uh, they are coming out with a new album in March and they've released a single so far called Numb Without You that I haven't been listening to too much only because I know that when their album comes out I'm going to be listening to it a lot so I'm trying not to over listen to the single right now and so those are the only things that are non-k-pop so if for some reason you're like okay bye <laughs> then you can leave and if, if you don't want to hear about the k-pop um uh, for physical things that I actually have, I'm not, I'm not going to get into it. It's EXO because, uh, I just never get tired of their music and this is their Love Shot album. I have both editions, both versions of it. It's so good. I've been mostly listening to Trauma, like that's the number one song from the entire album that I've just been playing a lot, so there's a shout out to an EXO song. Oh, I will also link my, like, January playlist Every month I do a Spotify playlist, and so I'll, I'll leave a link to the January playlist in the description. And um, I have a sort of, like, YouTube music thing first to mention, and that is Form of Therapy, which is a YouTube channel. Um, PD, that's PD, that's, like, what he goes by. Um, he does the series called Producer Reacts, and it's just, he, he, is into music, but also he really likes music videos, and he's like that kind of producer, and I just like the insight that he gives to the K-pop music videos, along with like, uh, like the music video itself, but then also in alignment with the lyrics to the, the song, and like what's happening with the story of that. Specifically, uh, three, well, four videos that he did that I really liked were his, um, producer react videos to, Lonely Night by KNK, All Night by Astro, and then the All Light album first listen, which is um, Astro's album, and then Ya yeah by Huta, which is Minhyuk from B2B. I don't know why he's going by Huta, but whatever. Um, so then I'm going to just probably go through these songs like really quickly because I'm going to run out of time in like three minutes. So here we go. Astro, I've become an Aroha. Aroha? They, I don't know why I sound like really weird when I say that. It makes me think of Aloha. So anyway, that's Astro's fandom. Officially, I'm a part of four fandoms now. Um, XOL, uh, Carrot, and Vix. What am I saying? Starlight? <laughs> uh, and then now Aloha. So anyway, <laughs> uh, their All Light album is like so good. I'm contemplating getting it, and there are albums from groups that I like way more. Well, okay, not way more, but, like, there are still EXO albums that I don't even have yet, yet I'm contemplating getting this Astro album. So I took it as a sign. I was like, okay, you're probably, you should be a part of this fandom. Four groups now. Um, yeah. Oh, also, Astro got their first win, which is great. It's super exciting. And I was, I was like, they better get a first win for this. Um... Lonely Night by KNK, first, first bop, jam, whatever of the year for me, yeah. Uh, ya yeah by Huta, <laughs> again, Minhyuk from B2B, uh, his album Huta Zone, that's great. Uh, CLC finally came back with their album, their mini album called Number One, it's really good. Breakdown is a song that I really like, but I, ha I haven't, like, gotten to listening to the other songs all that much. Uh, it might not be called Breakdown, it might be like Breakthrough or something, uh, but No, No, so good. It's like one of the only songs I'm listening to, like on repeat right now. So good. Um, WJSN, I've been listening to Save Me, Save You, La La Love, and Dreams Come True. A Pink, I'm getting into more girl groups, it's just a thing. A Pink came out with Ung Ung, or like Percent Percent, however you want to say it. Um, that's really good. I like Chungha's Gotta Go, but I, I I think it's getting a little old already. 
Um, oh man, I'm gonna run out of time. I can't talk about it. But Bang Yangook from BAP came out with Hikikomori. It's hard hitting. It's it made me cry. Okay, I can't continue with that. Uh, DRP Live text me playlist playlist and action. I've been listening to a lot. Uh, Zion T's Mala Gang. Uh, Wu Wan J, or he just goes by like Wu now. Uh, Cash, that's really good. Seventeen's Getting Closer. Penomeco featuring Crush number five. Uh, Uptension, I Need You. Lucent, Falling Petals, So Hyun, Magic, and um, Hala and Say My Name by ATs. Okay, I'm going to run out of time, so I have to say goodbye and thank you for watching and tell me what your favorite things were in uh, January. And I'm probably, yeah, just going to wrap up some other January stuff after I'm done saying goodbye.